Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Adult Literacy Education Journal, Writing for Publication. My name is Lauren Osowski. I'm a Senior Project Manager at ProLiteracy, responsible for publication of the journal. During the presentation, everyone's microphone will be muted. However, we do have a smaller group, so if there are questions towards the end, we can unmute some people, but we'll stay muted during the presentation to allow for a clean recording. Please use the chat function to introduce yourself, share links and resources with the group or ask questions of other attendees. You can use the Q&A function, which is a separate button next to the chat, to ask questions of the presenters. This helps us to better track those questions and make sure that we're able to answer everybody's questions during the webinar and we don't miss them. Sometimes they get lost in the chat. Um, after the webinar, all registrants will receive a follow-up email with links to the recording of the webinar from today, the slide deck that our presenters will share, a chat and Q&A sharing script, and also a certificate of attendance for attending live today. We'll share that out later this week or perhaps on Monday, beginning of next week with everyone. And feel free to forward that to anyone you think might be interested that couldn't attend with us today. All right, so let's kick things off here. I want to welcome our presenters. We have Alisa Belzart and Amy Rose, who are two of our journal editors. Uh, Heather Brown could not be here with us today, but we'll learn a lot from Amy and Alisa. So I will pass it over to you. I'll stop sharing my screen and go ahead and share yours. Amy, you're on mute. Just Amy, you're on mute. Okay. Amy's working on sharing the screen there. It'll be, we'll start in one second. There we go. Okay. So sorry. <laughs> um well, welcome. We're we're actually thrilled to have such a big group. We we consider this a huge group, and um, but we're hoping that we can have a, a bit of a discussion and that people have ideas about what they would might like to see, what they what about articles they might like to write for the journal. So let's just get started. Not okay. So, first of all, a little bit about the journal. Amy, you skipped a slide. You're one. I ahead. thought I did. What happened there? Ah, okay. So this is our journal, and uh, it, it's an open access journal. You may reach it through the Pro Literacy webpage. It's issued. Uh, three times a year, published three times a year. It's a relatively new journal, so we started publishing in April of 2019. We some of our some of our uh, issues are themed, and some are not. And so you do not have to submit a piece that's related to a theme. We try for one themed issue per year. Sometimes that works. Sometimes it did, doesn't. It's absolutely free online. If you're not familiar with the journal, we hope you will go look at it on the on the Pro Literacy webpage. So far, we're indexed in ERIC and in EBSCO, and uh, we have both peer-reviewed articles and reports and invited columns. So. Although probably many of you know this already, I would like to briefly go over what is the peer review process. When an article comes into us, whether it's a research article or an opinion piece, um, we or a report from the field, we look at it to make sure it's in scope. In scope generally means that in some way it's connected to our audience. And so it deals with adult basic education, adult literacy, English as a second language, numeracy, uh, sometimes developmental education. So is it in scope? If it's in scope, 
we assign it to three reviewers who review it anonymously. So they don't know who you are and you don't know who they are. And they have about four weeks to respond. Sometimes it takes them a bit longer and sometimes it takes that we don't find reviewers that quickly. So although ideally the turnaround would be about five weeks from beginning to end, sometimes it goes a little bit longer. When it comes back, you're going to have um, a recommendation of either accept, conditionally accept, revise and resubmit, or reject. Most papers do not come back on the first time as accept. Um, sometimes, they, rarely, they come back as conditional accept. That means they don't need to go out again to the reviewers, but they, some work needs to be done. Revise and resubmit means that you need to make changes to the paper and then it goes back out to the reviewers. So it's another four to six week process, which is why we really can't predict when a paper will be published. And sometimes papers go out to the reviewers two or three times. After the reviewers send back their recommendations, we, the editors, make a um, make a final recommendation, and that's what gets sent to you. So, as I spoke about, there's our there's our scope: literacy, numeracy, language topics. Uh, we hope that the journal is relevant to practitioners, researchers, policymakers, and funders, and we look for papers on all of those topics. We're also focused on program management, teaching, learning, and learning for adults below the post-secondary level of education and skill. So what, as I very briefly touched on, these are the components of the journal. We have research papers, viewpoints, and reports from the field that are all peer reviewed. And then we have features that are invited and do not go through the peer review process. We're going to talk about each one of these individually. And what you're seeing here is just uh, a copy of the first page of a research article. And it says research article here. So research articles. Research articles are empirical research, field-based research. They can be critical essays. They can be philosophies, history, theoretical. Um, they can be a variety of methods, qualitative, quantitative, or mixed methods. And um, every, it, and of course, it goes through the blind review process. It has to be an APA format. At the moment, it's APA 7 format. And the word length is 7,500 words. And when the reviewers look at your article, they're going to be looking specifically at the method. Does the method fit the research questions? Is that clear? Are your findings clear? A viewpoint article is much shorter. It's 2,500 words. And it takes on a specific perspective. And it, it's how you can look at trends, you can look at a point of view, it's an interpretation of changes. It can be on almost anything uh, related to the field, but it still goes through the peer review process. And uh, again, it has to have APA format. It's much shorter, as I said, it's 2,500 words. And very often it can be in the first person, although research articles may be in the first person also. And it, it sends a point of view. And reports from the field, which we're really hoping that many of you will, will try to write, really tells about things that people are doing in the field. So again, it's shorter, it's 2,500 words also APA for, format, also goes out for blind review, but it deals with things that are you're dealing with or have developed in the classroom. So teachers, tutors, program directors, supervisors, any practitioner 
is welcome to submit. Of course, the welcome to submit for anything, but this is this component is particularly for those people. And um, describes promising or successful innovations or challenges that may not have been directly tested yet, but that you feel it's worth sharing. It can reflect on actual teaching practices or administrative practices. Practices. Okay, so I'm going to take over from here and talk about the features that are the invited um, aspects of the journal. Um, so first of all is the forum. The forum is, uh, as indicated, it's invited. And what we try to do in the forum is to take on um, a timely topical issue that um, maybe there's some differences of opinion about, different perspectives, or just different approaches. So sometimes we try to find, um, well, usually we set it up as one main article where we have someone sort of take a position on something, and then we have two people respond to that main article. So that's the forum. It's sort of meant to be a little bit of a conversational format, not really, but two responses to a main statement. Or sometimes we invite three authors who just represent very different positions in the field or in their respective areas to take on the topic from their own point of view. Um, so these are meant to kind of raise up issues, question, critique, um, something that is going on in the field. Um, so this is a longer piece in total because it's three different authors, but each piece is relatively short. So if we have a main piece and two respondents, if the first piece is a little longer and the responses are each 2,500 words. Um, again, we do invite people to write these rather than um, just wait for people to submit. Um, and we kind of craft them in terms of you know what what makes sense right now and also who would be the best people that we can think of to take this on i will say sometimes we we struggle to identify a forum topic because we've been doing this for a while and we'd always be interested in getting your suggestions of a topic that you think would be good to take on um so um these three pieces are meant to be read as a whole um, but they also can each stand by themselves separately Okay, then we have some columns. Uh, first of all, we have book and resource reviews. So um, these review obviously both published books and other kinds of published, uh, yeah, published books, and then also other kinds of published resources. Um, so this is an example of a review of a book, but our resource um, column is more like, for example, curriculum or guidebooks or that sort of thing. We have a separate editor for each of the book review and the resource review. If you are interested in becoming a reviewer or you're interested in suggesting something that should be reviewed, you can contact our reviewers directly. Um, we are especially interested in, for example, graduate students or early career scholars who might be interested in writing reviews. Um, so um, you can just raise your hand if this is, you know, virtually, if this is something you're interested in um, by contacting the editors. These are generally pretty short and the editors each have their own sort of um, format that they recommend be used for, for reviews. Um, next, we have a column called the Research Digest. And um, we, created this column knowing that there's a lot of research out there that most people, especially practitioners, wouldn't necessarily run into on their own. So we ask scholars in the field to take on a topic um, and do either kind of like a summary and discussion of one or two key articles or a topic that we think will be of interest um, to, the, to our audience where they're really trying to sort of synthesize and create um, a, a bit of a comment about the research in that area. So we do invite authors to do this. Um, typically, we invite people pretty experienced at synthesizing uh, research, and um, we're asking them to kind of bring it to the field in ways that are accessible, 
not only by letting them know about this research, but in ways that are written accessibly. So that is our next column. And then I think this is our last column. We have a column called hmm, uh, Technology Solutions for Adult Basic Skills Challenges. And this uh, looks particularly at technology tools and platforms that are, again, designed to address specific challenges in the field. This has been authored by David Rosen, our columnist. We are in a transitional time now, um, so that will shift over, but the basic gist will remain the same. So again, this is a columnist. We don't invite anyone. It's not a rotating thing. The columnist writes the same column. I mean, same columnist writes in each issue. So those are all the aspects of the journal and the main areas we see people probably on this call fitting in is perhaps most likely reports from the field, um, maybe research articles, especially if you're a doctoral student or an early career uh, academic scholar, um, possibly getting involved in reviews. Um, or if you have ideas for forums, uh, we'd really love to hear from you. Um, so if you're interested in looking at the journal, which we hope you already do, but if you haven't seen it, um here's the url for it but basically if you go to the pro literacy website and navigate to um, publications uh on the top navigation bar of the home page it will take you to the journal once you get there you'll have the opportunity to see full issues individual articles from the most current issue all the way back to um, our first issue back in 2019. Um, there's also details uh, about uh, guidelines for authors, format, um, word length, uh, you know, maybe a little bit more detailed description of what we've given you today. And then you'll also find the article submission form. If you want to submit an article, you do it through this uh, clicking on that button, and it takes you to a Google form that allows you to fill in your information and upload your paper. Okay, so if you decide you'd like to submit, this is where it takes you to if you say you want to um, submit. As you see, it's a Google form that will ask you for your basic information and again, will allow you to upload your paper. There's also information about how to contact us um, and that's pretty much very straightforward. So if you want to get involved, I've kind of already highlighted this, but just to drive it home, if you want to get involved, you can write an article, uh, either a research practitioner or viewpoint piece. I guess I didn't mention viewpoint before as a likely way to go in. Viewpoint, again, is really more like an opinion piece. Um, and if you're interested in doing a review, you should contact Daphne or Susan Finn Miller. And if you're not sure if uh, what you'd be interested in reviewing would really count as a book or a resource review, the two of them can help you sort that out. Also, if you um, have a background in research, you could possibly become a consulting editor. Um, we do look for um, sort of practitioner researchers, people who are working in the field, but maybe are in graduate school or have gone to graduate school and have some experience re with research, especially to review the practitioner pieces, the reports from the field. Um, so if you're interested in becoming a consulting editor, you can reach out to us. By the way, the consulting editors, those are the people who review the papers, just to be clear. I don't, sometimes the terminology is confusing. We have a list of people who are our regular reviewers. They're known as consulting editors. And then we also have guest reviewers when sometimes we need to ask someone who hasn't committed to being a on our review board, but they have an area of expertise that we think will be particular, particularly useful. And sometimes people are interested in becoming reviewers and we'll use them as guest reviewers a couple, two, three times um, to get a sense of, you know, do they return stuff on time? Do they write um, sub substantive reviews and so forth? And if they do, then we uh, would potentially add them to our consulting editors panel. So um, again, here are our three co-editors. Amy and I are here with you. Heather's not able to attend today. If you have any questions about 
things you might be interested in writing, you're not sure, you'd like more information, you can always contact us at the journal email address that's here. I think Lauren's been popping links and email addresses into the chat as we've been talking. Um, we're always happy to hear from you and we'll respond as quickly as possible. So with that, um, this is an opportunity for you to ask us questions. Um, even you could float ideas um, as long as, you know, we don't want to take up too much time with any one person, but just even if you have some ideas and you'd like to know, does this fit? We could give you some feedback and that might give other people um, ideas about sort of what, what would be a good fit for the journal. Or if you have any questions about any of the logistics or mechanics of this, we'd be happy to take the questions. So does anyone have any questions or comments, things they'd like to say about the journal? You can either type it in the chat or raise your hand. Well, I guess we can't see hands. Uh, you type it into the Q&A. Yeah, type into the Q&A. I will say while we're giving you a chance to type, we're very eager to get papers from practitioners for reports from the field, uh, especially. We think that's a really important um, aspect of the journal, and um, we just would love to have a good collection of papers coming in. Uh, just to add, Lauren says if you raise your hand, she'll unmute you. So you don't have to type it if you don't want. <clears throat> Hi, Jenny. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Oh, okay. Um, so this is Jenny. Oh, it says Jenny, but I'm actually Christina, but we're we're a team together. Um, we're actually interested in writing about a functional literacy program that we've adopted over this last year that relies heavily on collaborative case management with other community organizations. Uh, it, we even have like a cloud-based system that we're using and we're seeing really good results from it. That, that sounds really great. And I will say, as Amy said, you don't have to have done a research study on it, but seeing positive results, sort of, you know, getting yeah. a sense that this is really something worth sharing would be great. And I think, um, you know, think about your audience as other people in the field who might be interested in knowing about this to try to think about how this might work in their context. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, so you'll definitely be getting some correspondence from us. Good. That's wonderful. We'll look forward to it. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Anyone else can feel free to raise your hand. And I can unmute you since we've got a small group today. It's nice to be able to interact a bit. Any questions about the review process or uh, also we're very interested to get feedback on the journal if you have any to share with us. Or as Lisa said, if you have ideas about things issues you'd like to see discussed that we could add to our one of our columns or the forum. Go ahead, Claudia. Thank you. Can you tell us more information about reviewing publications that are out right now, uh, particularly books about adult education? So um, do you mean getting something reviewed or being a reviewer? Becoming a reviewer. So uh, I think the best thing to do is to write um, our book review editor, that's Daphne Greenberg, and let her know that you're interested in doing reviews and tell her a little bit about yourself so she can get a sense of who you are and um, whether or not it would be a good fit and also what kind of thing you might be best positioned to actually review. Okay, and can I reach her at the A A L E journal at proliteracy.org? No, we well, can forward it though. That might be the easiest. Okay. Yeah, use that email and we'll forward it to her. Thank you. Thank you. Kit, go ahead. Hi. Um, so I'm actually working on my master's thesis right now, and um, my topic is centered around retired adult learners who um, are not pursuing education for workforce reasons. 
Um, and I've honestly found it pretty hard to find research related to that topic, um, just the, the age range in particular. But you're not talking about, uh, you're, you're talking about retired people who are just taking classes, not retired mm -hmm. people who are looking to take literacy or basic education. No, right. no, no, retired people who are taking ABE. Oh, okay, okay. Hmm. Yeah, I, that sounds like a really interesting topic. Yeah. I'm not sure what it, I didn't quite hear a question in there, but it sounds very, very interesting and important because, you know, WIOA has placed such a strong emphasis on workforce development. And we know there's a lot of people who would like to improve their skills for other reasons and maybe aren't even in the workforce. And I think um, providing services for that population is tricky because. Uh, <clears throat> Programs that are funded through Title II are expected to do workforce development. And if they want to work with that older population, they either have to sort of almost pretend that they're doing workforce development or force them to do workforce development just to get the literacy services or get funding through alternative means. So I think whatever it is that's going on, I don't know if you're doing a literature review or you're, you're actually looking at programs. I think you're raising a really important issue. and. Um, I think it would be interesting. I mean, I could almost see that as a forum piece. Like, yeah, that's that's kind of what I was thinking. Just that's after. interesting. Yeah. Uh, so Thank providing you. providing services uh, for people outside the workforce. What right. are they use? How are programs doing that? Um, yeah, that's a great. I idea. actually I actually cite you a few times in my thesis. <laughs> um, just kind of more of your qualitative work because. I'm arguing that qualitative research on this subject is kind of more needed. Um, my, the program that I work for, actually, we are not heavily funded by um, workforce sources. We have a lot of alternative funding, so we have a very big retired population. And just through working with those people, I've kind of just thought about their position within ABE and yeah, I'm just having trouble finding things that are similar to it. Or a viewpoint piece. You could also do a viewpoint piece on that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it'd be great if you wrote a short a short viewpoint piece kit just to kind of raise up the issue. Um, and and even though there's not a lot of research, that's the good thing in a viewpoint. It can you can take a position and it can be based on your experience as a practitioner and your knowledge of learners and the fact that you know that there's not that much research out there and you think there should be yeah that would be perfect thank you thank you we'd love to see that yeah and i know that that is an issue for many of our pro literacy member programs who are smaller community-based organizations who do serve many students without WIOGA goals and there is no research on those students it's a much smaller pool so that would be great kit we'd love to see something like that Thank you. Yeah, I was planning on um, submitting my thesis once it's completed. But even before that, you could do a viewpoint, not just that one issue. Okay. If you if you're interested. Okay. I, I think your thesis would no doubt be too long for. Um, well, right. Depends. Well, if it's a literature review, and you wanted to submit it as a research piece, you could. But I think I can imagine that your priority is to get your thesis done. But if you wanted to submit a viewpoint piece, just a very, you know, a short position piece, I think that would be awesome. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Anything? Are there other questions? Maybe while people are talking or thinking about typing some questions here, I'll pose a question to our editors um, that I've heard you speak about before, Aliza, that I think is really interesting, because I think sometimes people think of the journal as kind of out of bounds, out of reach, that it's hard to write for. Um, could you talk a little more about the review process and it, does my paper need to be perfection the moment I submit it to you? Is there any room for discussion or editing once it's submitted. Um, could you just talk a little more about that process? Amy, do you want to take that or you want me to? I, I, I can start. Um, so it's 
Well, I, I, there are two answers. Of course, there are always going to be changes, but it should be as perfect as you can make it. And there are several reasons for that. It goes out to reviewers and they need to understand what you're trying to say. And if they don't understand, they're not going to accept it. Uh, so you really need to make it clear. Now, of course, if you've got a typo or something, that's fine. But if your paper is riddled with typos, that will create the impression that you haven't really taken care with it. So now this doesn't mean, though, that once it comes back from review, there won't be changes because, yes, there will be changes. And then it goes through copy editing in, a, in, in addition. But you should get it as perfect as you can. Um, that's my answer. <laughs> yeah, I would agree that you should make your very your best effort to make it as good as you possibly can. Um, we've had people submit very sloppy things like papers that still have track changes in them. We've had graduate students submit papers that have teacher comments in them. Um, that's very annoying. <laughs> and I, I think that the point about like many, many typos is reviewers, um, you know, they try to be objective, but when a paper seems a little thrown together, I think they might put a little less effort into trying to really give it their best read. I mean, we're all human and you just get a little frustrated. So. Yeah, no, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to be your best effort. We want it to be your best effort. And then most papers um, get a revise and resubmit uh, rating. So yes, you do have opportunity to improve. You get two opportunities if you need it, um, at least. So if you get a revise and resubmit and um, you get that and you get the reviewers comments on your paper it gives you a lot of guidance on what's needed to make the paper better if you do the revisions and you resubmit it it goes back out to those generally back out to those same reviewers so that they can see oh i see this author took the time to really respond to my comments and has addressed them um, but i still see this or this um, so sometimes it's re revise and resubmit again a second time. Like it's made some improvements, but it still has some issues, some significant issues, in which case it gets sent back to the author with the second round of comments. Um, and then the author has the opportunity to revise again. You get two chances to revise. And if it hasn't gotten good enough by that point to become what we call conditionally accepted, it would be rejected at that point. That's pretty unusual. The more usual thing is either someone decides not to continue forward because the level of re request for revisions is so high that they just maybe feel like maybe this paper isn't ready yet. Um, or um, uh, I think I lost my train of thought. Um, it So you get, oh, right. So you get, if people get revised and resubmit, they might decide not to continue or they might revise. And then what happens is if it, it's really getting close um, and the reviewers have agreed and we've decided that it's conditional accept, conditionally accepted, then it's just kind of a back and forth between the editors and the author to address, usually it's a few last things. It doesn't go back out for review but it still goes back to the author until the conditions are met. So there are definitely many opportunities to continue to make it better and better. And the, the wonderful thing about a peer review process is that it really does make the papers better in the end. Um, and the author can't always, and this is true for very experienced writers like Amy and me, you just can't always see everything because you're, it's so much in your head and you're so familiar with it that having outside readers give you feedback really is a great opportunity to know what would make it better and to make it a stronger paper. So when I first started doing this, I'd be like, oh, when I got revised and resubmit. But over time, I really realized my paper is always better um, by the time, hopefully, that it gets accepted than when I sent it in. So it was my first best effort, but then it gets better and better. I would just add, though, that it can get annoying. 
especially because sometimes what happens is reviewers give you a list of things to do and you think you've done them and that only spurs on more questions. So some reviewers will say, okay, I'm going to work with what you, what we sent you the first time, but others will say, oh, now that, I, now that I'm looking at this again, I see this, this, and this. And so then, um, then it becomes an issue of what you can do and what you want to do. So, and we recognize that we've all had that experience. We've all had that experience. And um, that, that is just part of the process. And very normal that you right. have to go through several rounds. It, you know, I think a lot of people who aren't experienced with this process feel like, oh, I'm a failure if, I, if it doesn't get accepted like right away. As Amy said, that's very rare. It's very normal to go through a couple of rounds before something is accepted. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen something just be accepted. They've been conditionally accepted. Rarely on the first time. Rarely conditionally accepted, but never accepted, just flat out. Because they can always be better. Right. And other readers can always see what will make it better. That was a long answer to a good question, Lauren. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but it was a really good and, and important answer also, because I think some people see it as a scary process um, and that collaborative nature that you both described, um, I, I think is really important. So thank you for your answers there. Um, do we have any final questions? Otherwise we can give people back a little bit of their day. Oh, Stacy, go ahead. Hey there, everybody. Thanks for doing this. Um, I think I kind of have a question. I hope it makes sense. <laughs> um, I'm one who's a little intimidated as well by this. So I'm wondering if it has to be like really great research for like uh, maybe like the field or the viewpoint one. Um, I'm thinking we have a kind of a messaging thing that we've put out there to address the barriers our learners face because we too work with a lot of those people who maybe are retired just have the time or maybe they have a learning disability or they don't have a real specific goal so we're trying to um, engage the public and the powers that be whether it's government foundations whatever um, that you know everybody has skills they're all worthwhile how we can incorporate this with like all the workforce stuff that's coming up at the moment um, so it's not I think it would be maybe talking with others in our field, how we can all work together, how we're addressing those barriers for our adult learners. Um, I just don't know if that would be appropriate or if that even makes sense at the moment. <laughs> I could see that going two ways, Stacey. I could see that as a viewpoint article. And I could also see it as a report from the field in terms of communicating what you're doing to try to um, elevate this, the needs for this population. As far as I, I, I didn't really catch what you said at the beginning about like really good research or something like that. <laughs> I mean, there are, you know, there are ideas about what is high quality research and we would, ex we do expect our reviewers to make judgments about the quality of the research. So, you know, do, does the, do the findings match up with the research question? Is it clear what the what the basis is of the claims that are being made and so on and so forth? And I would say if you've never conducted a research project, if you haven't done it in school, in graduate school or something like that, it might be kind of hard to take that on just as a, I'll see if I could do a research project without some assistance. Maybe there's someone at your local university that might be uh, interested in doing it with you. Um, but if you're if you're feeling intimidated and maybe not that knowledgeable about doing research, a viewpoint piece or a report from the field would be ideal. Okay, awesome. That I appreciate that. Is that yeah, I, I would agree. I, I, from what you're describing, I mean, I can see why you might think this would could become a research project and that you're doing interviews. But it sounds like this is part of a decision to connect with the community, which would which would really make it a stronger piece for the report from the field, if I'm understanding correctly. Okay. So you talk to people, you try to send your message out. Um, I think that would be great, uh, but you could also craft it as a as a viewpoint if that seemed more appropriate. Or yeah. we could make that, you know, you could say, I don't know what this is, and we 
we sometimes decide. And sometimes people put something in as a viewpoint and we say, no, this looks like more like a report from the field. Or vice okay. versa. Or, you're right, or vice versa. And the other thing I'll say to all of you is if you feel uncertain about this kind of thing, shoot us an email. Um, you don't have, it, it, we're very approachable. And it's not like it's a black box of, you know, you just have to sort of submit something and see what happens. You can talk to us before you submit, before you even start writing, if you have an idea and you're just not quite sure where it fits or how it fits or, um, you know, we, we're not really equipped to mentor you through the whole process of writing or conducting a research project, but we certainly would be happy to talk to you about questions and ideas you have along these lines. Does that answer your question, Stacy? It does, yes, very much. Thank you. Good. Anything, mm -hmm. anyone else? I, I will just say that we're really eager to hear from you. Um, we're really happy to get papers um, in, and we really appreciate your coming today to learn more about the journal. I think we're passing it back to Lauren at this point. Yeah, I was just checking for any final questions. I don't see any coming in. So I think we can wrap up a little early. Um, but as always, if a question pops in your head as soon as we hit end, feel free to shoot that over in an email to the journal team. We'd be happy to chat with any of you at any time. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And I especially want to thank Amy and Elisa for presenting um, this important topic. Uh, we are very proud of our research journal. And thank you all for taking an interest. We hope to see your names in print very soon. So thank you all for coming and hope everyone has a great day. Bye. Bye. Bye.